A reading from the Hebrew Bible, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 52, verses 7 through 10. Listen for the word of God stirring within and beyond these words of Scripture. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of one who brings good news, proclaiming peace, bringing good news, proclaiming salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns, daughter. Daughter, the sound of your sentinels lifting their voice as one they sing for joy. For from one eye to another, they see the return of the Holy One of Sinai to Zion. Revel, raise a song together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Holy One of old has comforted God's people. God has redeemed Jerusalem The mighty God has bared a holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. For the word of God in its promise and covenant, thanks be to God. May we pray with one another. Calm, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire and lighten us with your celestial fire. For if your salvation comes, then nothing else matters. And if your salvation does not come, then nothing else matters. Let the whole wide world see your great salvation here and now. We make this plea. In the name of the one who is to come. Amen. Finally, a traditional biblical text for Advent that makes some sense. I don't have to ask, who chose this text? Or uh, what does this text have to do with Advent? Of course, there is a question about Feet being beautiful, which does sound a bit strange to me. Podiatry was not a topic we covered in seminary. And second, feet are often a euphemism in the Hebrew Bible, but we're not going to go there this morning on the fourth Sunday of Advent, which happens to coincide on the day we call Christmas Eve. Of the three questions that have been with us throughout most of Advent, one remains. What on earth am I going to do with this text? Truthfully, that question always remains. It abides. I hope it does forever. There's always an adventure in the biblical text, including those texts that seem to fit nicely within the season, or are otherwise familiar. Isaiah, however, is one of the most confusing, complex, and complicated books in the biblical canon. Isaiah is prophecy. Isaiah is poetry. Isaiah proceeds by disjunctive fits and starts and portrays the holy God as both unbearably harsh and astonishingly healing. Isaiah, as a biblical text, spans some 225 years, which makes it highly unlikely that one person wrote the book. Isaiah is a combination, an edited collection of poets who tell an inconvenient truth about the present moment and who point to the future God wants and ultimately will have. In other words... Isaiah is an adventure. For the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, God is mostly mad, and not just mad, but hella mad. There is fire and brimstone. And yet the current word is never, ever the final word. 
For what is ultimate is the resolve of the Holy One and the captivity of, or, sorry, and the capacity of the mighty God to do something utterly new amidst pervasive, dire circumstances that appear to be settled, unchanging, permanent even. Because this book spans more than two centuries, we can hardly imagine the span of time when absolutely nothing changes. The status quo becomes a constant, a given. If there is good news to be heard, it seems a far-off hymn. Between the end of Isaiah chapter 39 and the beginning of Isaiah chapter 40, there is consensus among mainstream scholars that there is a gap of 160 years. It's a long pause. It's an even longer wait. Even the poets put down their pen. God, whose anger we cannot excuse and must take seriously, seemingly changes their divine mind in Isaiah 40, which opens with an imperative command of God to God's own messengers to comfort, comfort God's people. In one edited book, Jerusalem is under judgment And that draws the negating attention of God. And in that same book, Jerusalem is addressed in exile, in recognition of its need, and in assurance to match that need. In this same book, poets imagine Jerusalem as healed, restored, ransomed, forgiven. Jerusalem is the meeting place of divine will and historical reality. Jerusalem is the recipient of God's judgment and God's renewing comfort and mercy. But we don't live in Jerusalem. We live in Elyria, Ohio, or North Ridgeville, or Chagrin Falls, or Vermilion, or Grafton, or Westerville, New Albany, or Clarksville, Arkansas, Claiborne, Maryland, New York, or somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. We are not in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is somewhere over there, not here. We read at a distance, or so we, so we think. And, and yet, Jerusalem, as depicted in Isaiah, is anywhere and everywhere people face oppression of any kind. Jerusalem is the place where people are affected by warfare. Jerusalem is the place where 2,000-pound bombs create craters where civilians once lived in apartment high-rises. Jerusalem is the place where people are marginalized for sex, gender, orientation, race, or class. Yes, Jerusalem, literally speaking, is a place with definite coordinates and a spot on the map. But here in Isaiah, Jerusalem is not so much a location on the map as it is the site of people who live under imperial rule, suffer under authoritarian regimes, and face oppression just because they exist. When working on the worship guide this week, I wanted to find a piece of art that captured a city in ruins, but showed forth the hope of promise and possibility. Kelly Latimer created the artwork that's on the front cover of our worship guide for a group called Red Letter Christians. The organization said of her art, our hope is that this icon, Christ in the rubble, will create more dialogue among Christians in the United States 
during this holy season about the ways our beliefs and actions or lack thereof contribute to the violence we're currently witnessing in Gaza? How can we shape a culture of Christianity where love truly has no boundaries? How do we create a world where our poor, homeless, refugee, Palestinian savior, born to a teenage mother and later condemned to death, would be cherished had he been born today? These questions are necessary for us to take seriously if we are to meet the babe of Bethlehem, the Christ child who is born in the rubble. Bethlehem, the city of Jesus' birth, is a Palestinian town in the occupied West Bank. Just before Kelly painted the artwork on our worship guides, the Reverend Munther Isaac, pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church in Bethlehem, stood beside the small nativity scene in his chapel. The baby Jesus sat amid flickering candles atop a pile of busted cement and dirty stone. This is what Christmas looks like in Palestine, Isaac said. This is the true message. Salvation comes in the rubble. The terrorist attack by Hamas upon the people of Israel on October 7th of this year that killed 1,200 people must be unequivocally condemned. Hamas also took some 240 hostages. Such violence is wrong. It is sin and a crime against both God and neighbor. The Israel Defense Forces are fighting to eradicate Hamas and have killed more than 20,000 people. In Gaza, with water, food, and shelter all short, international aid groups warn a humanitarian crisis and catastrophe is unfolding. The craters from bombs are numerous. What we're seeing unfold is an eye for an eye. Actually, 20 eyes. That's the letter I for every one eye. An eye for an eye, that's E-Y-E, leaves the whole wide world without sight. Many of us know that the Holy Land is home mostly to Jews and Muslims. But according to a recent Washington Post article, 2% of the Palestinian population of the West Bank is Christian, with many of them proudly tracing their roots back a millennium or more. There also exists a tiny remnant of Christians, maybe a thousand people, no more, in Gaza. In his annual Christmas message, Bethlehem Mayor Hannah Hananiah spoke this year of mourning and condemned Israel's prosecution of the war in Gaza as ethnic cleansing and genocide. So did the head of the Bethlehem Chamber of Commerce. I am sad and upset at the moral failure of the West to stop the killing of civilians in Gaza, Samir Hasbon said. To put a finer point on it, on Friday, December 8th, the United States alone vetoed a United Nations resolution 
backed by almost all other Security Council members and dozens of other nations demanding an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. Supporters of the resolution called it a terrible day and warned of more civilian deaths and destructions as the war goes into its third month. It's ironic, isn't it, that a country so hell-bent on celebrating Christmas is the country that creates the rubble and then places the Christ child there. This passage from Isaiah is exuberant, but I find it hard to convey the text with a manufactured joy. And yet I do think we can hear this oracle from Isaiah as a promise. How beautiful up on the mountains are the feet of the one who brings good news, proclaiming peace, bringing good news, proclaiming salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. When I worked for Bright Divinity School, I had the good fortune of meeting Mitri Rahib, who has been a professor and leader at Bethlehem Bible College in Bethlehem, Gaza, and Nazareth. He co he wrote a book with Disciples Minister Suzanne Watts Henderson. My worlds collided this week when I realized that Mitri Rahib and the Reverend Dr. Munther Isaac, whom I quoted earlier, are colleagues at this Bethlehem Bible College. The Reverend Dr. Isaac edited a book of Dr. Rahib's in which Dr. Rahib wrote the following. As for the God of this land, God is not like all the gods. God's land is plowed with iron. God's temples are destroyed by fire. God's people are trampled underfoot, and God does not seemingly move a muscle. The God of this earth is hidden from view. You search for God's traces, but do not see them. You long for God to split the heavens and come down to see, to listen, to be compassionate, to be saved. The God of this land does not repel brutal armies, but rather shares one fate with the people. God's house is demolished. God's child is crucified, but this mystery does not perish. Rather, Christ rises from the ashes, and with the refugees you see the divine. God walks, and in the dark of the night, God raises springs of hope. Without this God, Palestine remains a scorched land. It remains a field of destruction. But if God tramples the foundations, God, only, God will only make it a holy land, a land whose hills the good news of peace will resound. There have been times in our nation, too, when we have known the destruction of violence and war. January 6, 2021, was frightening, especially as the continuation of our democracy was anything but guaranteed. September 11, 2001, has echoes of the painting on the front of our worship guides. The bombing of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City on April 19, 1995, is another. And, and yet, the time most resonant in my mind is that of the Civil War some 160 years ago. There was a secession of states, a country split in two. 
There was the North and the South and a brutal war that claimed some 620,000 lives, approximately equal to the total of American fatalities in the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Mexican War, the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, and the Korean War combined. I cannot imagine the rubble. American poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow knew the pain of loss, of living in rubble. His first wife passed following complications from a miscarriage. His second wife died following an accidental fire. In 1863, Longfellow's oldest son enlisted in the Union Army against his father's wishes. In November of that same year, the son was critically injured in battle. And then one month later, on the 25th of December, Longfellow wrote the poem, Christmas Bells. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to all. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth God sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. Of peace on earth, goodwill to all. Salvation, beloved, comes through the sound of ringing bells. Salvation comes in the cries of the baby born in the rubble of Palestine. Salvation is an adventure. How beautiful up on the mountains, even the mountains of rubble, are the feet of of one who brings the very best, most beautiful gospel good news, proclaiming peace, proclaiming salvation, who says to all the people of the world, your God is yet alive and your God reigns. Amen. Amen.